first on Radio 4, we begin a new eight-part book at bedtime, A Month in the Country, by J.L. Carr, read by Samuel West. The year is 1920. The narrator, Tom Birkin, is a shell-shocked survivor of the First World War. He's on his, his way to a remote North Country village on his first professional assignment. When the train stopped, I stumbled out, nudging and kicking the kit bag before me. Back down the platform, someone was calling despairingly, Ox could be, Ox could be. No one offered a hand, so I climbed back into the compartment, stumbling over ankles and feet to get at the fishing basket on the rack and my folding camp bed under the seat. If this was a fair sample of northerners, then this was enemy country, so I wasn't too careful where I put my boots. I heard one chap draw in his breath and another grunt. Neither spoke. Then the guard whistled, the train jerked forward a couple of paces and stopped. This was enough to goad the old man in the near side corner to half lower his window. Those gonna get rare and sort reek down to the skin, maister, he said, and shut the window in my face. Then the engine blew up a splendid plume of steam and shuffled off. And I was alone on the platform, arranging my pack, taking a last look at the map, pushing it into my topcoat pocket levering it out again to spill my ticket on the station master's boots, wishing I'd thrown on two missing buttons, hoping that it would stop raining until I had a roof over my head. A youngish girl, her face flattened against a window pane, stared at me from the station master's house. It must have been my coat which interested her. It was pre-war, about 1907, I should imagine, thick herringbone tweed. It reached down to my ankles. Its original owner must have been a well-to-do giant. I saw that I was going to get very wet. My soles were letting in water already. The station master stepped back into his lamp room and said something, but I didn't follow his dialect. I said that you could borrow my umbrella, he repeated in tolerable English. Where I'm going to isn't too far, I said. According to the map, that is. Where would that be? he asked. The church, I said. I expect I shall dry out when I get there. Come on in and have your tea first, he countered. I've arranged to meet the vicar, I said. Oh, he said. I'm chapel. All the same, if you want for aught, send me word. I say, I hope it's there. He seemed to know why I'd come. I set off half-heartedly, sheltering my spare clothes, which were in the fishing basket, under my coat. The lane was where the map had said it ought to be. There was a dilapidated farmhouse, and after that a couple of hen huts collapsing amongst nettles in the decaying orchard. The rain made a channel from my trilby down my neck. Then I turned the corner of a high hedge and was in open pasture. And there was the church. It was an off-the-peg job. Evidently there had been no medieval wool boom in these parts. This had been starveling country, every stone an extortion. The short chancel had an unusually shallow pitched roof. It must have been added a good hundred years after the high main building. The tower was squat. But all in all, it looked pleasant enough. The graveyard wall was in good repair. There were some 18th century headstones, their lichen-stained cherubs, hourglasses and death's heads almost hidden by rank grass, nettle patches and fool's parsley. I glimpsed two or three spikes of a family grave overwhelmed by briars. I had to see if the rain gutters and downpipes were coping, so I threshed around the building. Not a gusher anywhere, not a trace of wash on the walls. Damps the doom of wall paintings. If there'd even been one green wall, I might as well have turned around there and then and let myself be washed back to the station. So I came back to the little porch, its stone sitting slabs polished by 500 years rubbing by backsides of funeral parties faint from incense or remorse. I twisted the ring handle and pushed the door open. It squealed, a warning I was to be grateful for during the next few weeks. And there I was. By and large, it was what I'd guessed it might be. A stone slabbed floor, three squat pillars on each side of the nave, two low aisles, and beyond a chancel, as much as I could see of it, strenuously reorganized by some Tractarian incumbent. The scaffolding, as I'd been told by letter, was rigged up, filling the chancel's arch. If there was a wall painting, this was where it would be, covered with lime wash and grime. I climbed the ladder. Much can be said against the Reverend J.G. Keach. Alas, yes. But when he stands at the judgment seat, this also must be said in extenuation. 
He was businesslike, Lord. And then I saw him, standing in the doorway below me, seeing by wet footprints that I had come. Good evening, Mr. Birkin, he said, and I climbed down. He was four or five years older than me, maybe thirty. A tall but not strong-looking man, neatly turned out, pale-eyed, a cold, cooped-up look about him, and long after he must have become used to my face twitch, he still talked to someone behind my left shoulder. He went straight to business. About your living in the bell chamber, I am by no means enthusiastic. Surely I made it quite clear in our correspondence that Mossop the sexton must ring the bell each Sunday and the rope passes through a hole in the floor. I hoped that you would make other arrangements, lodgings or a room at the Shepherd's Arms. I muttered something about money. And then, the stove, I said. What about the stove? Can I use it? The rain, like today. It wasn't in the contract, he hedged, somehow managing to imply that neither was my face twitch. We have to think about our expenses, too. You stated in your first letter that you would be bringing a primus stove. I might set something afire, I counted. Oh, all right, he said irritably. But you must see that it's left in an acceptable state on Sundays. And naturally, at all times, you will remember that this is a consecrated place. You are a churchman. Oh, yes, I told him. He could rely on me. I saw him considering a possible ambiguity here, wondering what precisely he could rely on me for. From his expression, the worst. I didn't look like a churchman. Indeed, I looked like an unsuitable person who, against his advice, had been unnecessarily hired to uncover a wall painting he didn't want to see. And the sooner I got it done and buzzed off back to sin-stricken London, the better. My face jerked. People like the Reverend J.G. Keach brought on the spasm. It began at my left eyebrow and worked down to my mouth. I'd caught it at Passchendaele, and wasn't the only one either. The medics said it might work off, given time. My wife, Vinnie, leaving, hadn't helped. I must have looked frightening because he gave the stove a kick, an embarrassed one. Now, he said, to touch on a delicate topic, he lowered his voice. Should you, when you feel a call of nature, you can use the hut in the northeast corner of the burial yard. You'll find it quite private behind some lilac bushes. When last I looked, there were a few tools Moss abuses. He looks after the churchyard as well as being verger. His scythe hangs from a nail in there. Ah, then perhaps you should ensure that it is safely secured before you... I thanked him, speculating if it was loss of life or only manhood he was concerned about. I told Moon he might use it too. What period do you suppose it to be? He couldn't possibly have meant the earth closet, so I supposed he meant the stove, and said, Oh, about 1890, 1900, somewhere about that time, and wondered who Moon, my secret sharer, was. No, no, he explained irritably, the mural, the wall painting. I told him I couldn't possibly know until I'd uncovered part of it. The costume would tell me within 10 or 20 years. But if he wanted me to guess, and guessing was all it would be, I'd say 14th century, after the Black Death, when surviving magnates were swallowing dead neighbors' estates at disaster prices, and while fear for their own skins was still sweating out some of the profits. When would you start? I was here. I'd started. Surely that was plain enough. Then he said, we shan't entertain any extras. There won't be any. There mustn't be any. You agreed to 25 guineas, 12 pounds and 10 shillings to be paid halfway, and 13 pounds and 15 shillings when finished and approved by Miss Hebron's executors. I have your letter here. Why just the executors, I asked. Why not you, too? That was a shrewd thrust. Merely Miss Hebron's omission in the form of bequest, he lied bitterly. An oversight, of course. Of course, I thought. Naturally. But he struck back. However, for all intent and purpose, I represent the executors. Miss Hebron came from an ancient local family, and she wished that the painting could be uncovered. I shan't mind if you touch it up. Any faint areas or even bits which may have disappeared, you can fill them in so long as it's appropriate and turns in with the rest. Incredible, I thought. Why are so many parsons like this? Must one excuse their defective sensibility towards their fellows because they are engrossed with God? And what about their wives? Can they possibly be like this at home? Mm -hmm. Of course, it isn't absolutely sure anything's there, I said, trying to sound matey. Of course there's something there. I may have a certain reservation, which I'm not prepared to discuss, about Miss Hebron, but she was no fool. She went up a ladder and scraped a patch until she found something. Good God, this was appalling. How big a patch, I moaned, 
staring wildly into the gloom above my chancel arch, my cheekbone clicking away like mad. One head, I believe, certainly not more than two. Probably half a dozen heads. She would have used sandpaper and a pan brush. I felt like running up the ladder and beating my head on the wall. Then she whitewashed it over again, he went on, quite oblivious to my distress. You might as well know here and now your employment has not my support. It would never have reached this stage but for the unreasonable position taken by her solicitors when I asked their agreement to an alternative use for your 25 guineas and their pig-headed refusal to pay out her £1,000 bequest to our fabric fund until the will's conditions were fulfilled. I gazed up into the darkness. However had she known it was there? But what if there was nothing except what was left of her heads? But if Keach, plainly a notable unbeliever, believed there was, then there must be. It occurred to me that perhaps he'd had a scrub too. It will be in full view of the people, he complained. It? I asked. It? Whatever it is, he said curtly, looking up the ladder. It will distract attention from worship. Only for a short time, I said. People tire of colour and shapes which stay in the same place. And they always believe that they have more time than they will have and that someday they'll come in the week and have a proper look. I'm just the same. Do you know, I believe that he actually did consider the validity of this argument before rejecting it. Then he went. He hadn't told me who Moon was. Perhaps we should run into one another behind the lilac bushes. I ran up the ladder again and did a few gentle bounces on the platform. It was commendably firm. Then I contemplated the great sweep of lime-washed wall before me. It was a solemn moment. It went, the wall that is, up to the roof timbers and sideways and downwards to the limits of the arch. Like a blind man, I ran the flats of both hands along its surface until I found the places Miss Hebron had distempered again. By nature, we are creatures of hope, always ready to be deceived again, caught by the marvel that might be wrapped in the graviest brown paper parcel. But I knew it was there, and I knew it was a judgment. It was bound to be because it was above the chancel arch in the plum spot where the people of the parish couldn't avoid seeing the god-awful things that would happen to them if they didn't fork out their tithes or marry the girls they'd got with child. It would be St. Michael weighing souls against sin, Christ in majesty refereeing, and down below the fire that flameth evermore. A really splendidly showy crowd scene. And perhaps I'd have done better to bargain for payment per head. I was so excited that only darkness stopped me from making a start. What luck. My first job. Well, first since leaving the army, and before that I had been learning my craft. Mustn't make a mess of it, I thought. The pay is terrible, but somehow I'll survive and have something to show future customers. And I willed it to be something good, really splendid, and truly astonishing. That was the first part of A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr. It was abridged by Elizabeth Bradbury, read by Samuel West, and produced by Tracy Neal. And you can hear part two at the same time tomorrow. Second part of our book at bedtime, A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr. Tom Birkin is installed on his scaffolding and is busy uncovering and restoring a medieval wall painting in the church of Oxgodby, a remote north country village, at the bequest of the late Laura Hebron of an ancient local family. He's met his employer, the rather hostile Reverend Keach, but has yet to meet Charles Moon, another great war survivor, who has also come to the village through a condition of the Hebron will to find the grave of Piers Hebron, who died in 1373. That night in the bell tower of Oxcudby Church, I slept like the dead, the first time during many months. Next morning, I awoke very early. In fact, I didn't sleep long after daybreak on any of the succeeding days. That first morning, I rolled up my blanket and, avoiding the bell rope, walked across to the south window. The rain had ceased and dew glittered on the graveyard grass. Beyond lay the pasture I had crossed on my way from the station, with a tent pitched near a stream. I unpacked my food store, primed my stove with meths, fried a couple of rashers and made a thick sandwich. It was very pleasant sitting on the boards, leaning against a wall because through my window I could see the hills heaving up like the back of some great sea creature, dark woods washing down its sides into the vale. And then, God help me, in the first few minutes of my first morning, I felt that this alien northern countryside was friendly, 
that I'd turned a corner and that this summer of 1920, which was to smolder on until the first leaves fell, was to be a propitious season of living, a blessed time. I told myself that I didn't care how long it took me to uncover the wall painting. I was going to be happy, live simply. The 25 quid they'd agreed to pay me might be made to spin out until cold weather drove me back to winter quarters in London. And afterwards, perhaps I could forget what the war and the rows with Vinnie had done to me and begin where I'd left off. This is what I need, I thought. A new start. And afterwards, maybe I won't be a casualty anymore. Well, we live by hope. I looked down into the nave. The light wasn't good, and on the platform near the roof timbers, far too dark to make a start on the wall. So I went down and had a look around the building. There was one good monument, a baroque bas-relief of a well-built young lady, Letitia Hebron, modestly hiding her essential glory by hanging on tight to a shroud as she clambered from an elegant catafalque. All very nicely carved by one A.H. in 1799, along with a rather fine inscription by her young husband. Conjugam optima amantissima et delectissima. Most loving and delightful wife. And on through eleven lines listing her matchless charms, until the twelfth, a single word, his sad last farewell, Bailey. I had a second look at Letitia, a long look after that testimonial. Her tightened shroud showed her to advantage, and she had a friendly face with a teasing upward turn of her lips. Conjugam optima amantissima et delectissima. Well, he was right. He'd had better luck than me. Then I carried my kit up the ladder and laid it out. A lancet for lifting lime wash, a jar of alcoholic solution of hydrochloric acid, brushes, dry colours, a jar of distilled ammonia. Most of it handed on to me by Joe Watterson when he'd announced that he'd done his last job and wished me luck. It's a profession, my boy, he had said and a bloody perilous and penurious one, but if a profession's a skilled job that not so many men can tackle, then it's a profession, all right. I moved gingerly about my new territory. Just above head level, the roof's keel drove back to bed itself into the tower wall. It was a splendid medieval gallery. The door squealed and a middle-sized sturdy chap was gazing up at me. He had a confident-looking round face, blue, knowing eyes. Good morning, he said. I'm Charles Moon and he pulled a squashed tweed hat off his tousled fair hair. I'm digging next door, in the meadow. You may have seen my tent. I meant to let you settle in, but I felt I had to come and have a look at you. Well, partly, but really, because I get so stiff in the night, my legs get me up so that I make a point of stumping across most mornings to see if Letitia's managed to climb out during the night. He waved a hand at the south aisle. I'll come down, I said, and did. He was 27 or 8, and his all thy waves and billows have gone over me look gave him away earlier even than three holes in the tunic's shoulders where his captain's pips had been. We went out into the sunshine and leaned on the wall. I asked him if he would be staying long and he pointed to his tent. Till the first frosts close me down. I'm reckoning to save enough to get me to air this coming winter. Woolley's uncovering the cigarette. He'll give me a job. Later I recognised this as vintage Moon, absurdly ingenuous in his belief that all would be well. I liked him from that first encounter and he liked me which always helps. I asked him what he was looking for. He laughed. Well, officially, for the grave of Miss Hebron's forebear, one Piers Hebron, died 1373. She'd come across a reference to his excommunication and decided he must have been buried outside the churchyard. I'm to find him, or at any rate look for him. She set aside 50 pounds to fence him in. He hurried through the account as if it didn't interest him. And do you expect to find it? Him? I mean, he could be anywhere. And didn't families like the Hebrons have the priests in their pockets? He's probably settled in a prime site under the altar. Moon grinned. Much later, I recalled it was an old-fashioned grin, as they call it in the North Riding. Well, he said, perhaps you're right. That's exactly what I told the old boy. The old boy? Her brother, the colonel. Not our show, Beau War. He saw my point. Absolutely damn right, Moon. Just what I told Addy. Lot of nonsense, Addy, I said. Could be anywhere. Could be those bones moss have turned up by the cucumber frame. Made no difference. Always came back to the same story. I suppose I can spend my money how I like, Ted. I'm going to leave you more than you'll ever need. Damn silly woman. Moon sniggered. I'm mortified that I never met her, he said, and fished into a pocket for his wallet. Look, here's a snapshot of our benefactor. Moss had lent it to me. It's a bit faded. I examined Miss Adelaide Hebron with immense interest. My first employer. 
She was a long-headed woman, her fair hair combed straight back, a faintly cynical smile turning up one corner of her lips, pale eyes, very fine nose. A colonel, particularly a Boer War colonel, hadn't an earthly against that field marshal's face. I have a feeling I might have hit it off rather well with her, Moon said. I think she'd understand my not giving a damn whether I do or don't dig the old devil up. But if you feel like that about it, why did you come? I had to ask. It seemed a bit of a fraud. Why, I saw at once what was here, he replied, as though astonished that I hadn't seen it too. Well, perhaps that's not strictly true. Probably fairer to say I recognised its possibilities. So I didn't clinch the deal till I had a Royal Flying Corps pal fly me over in his old string bag. We came over here in the late evening. That's the time of day to see what went on in the year dot. I was right. It showed quite distinctly. A basilica. If the Saxons had such things, it would have been called a chapel. Probably about 600, 650. Very, very early. I ought to let someone official know about it, and of course I shall. But not until I've plotted the building's foundations and got answers to two or three things that puzzle me. The locals have it fixed in their heads that I'm looking for a grave, so any stones they see are what's left of an old cowshed. I'm only telling you because you're bound to have tumbled to it anyway, living on top of me, as it were. When I finish the survey, I'll find time to prod around for old Piers Hebron's bones, just for the look of the thing. Hindsight, of course, but it came later to me that he knew exactly where he'd find them. Well, what are we standing around here for, he said. Come on, I'll brew up. We walked over to the tent. To my astonishment, it was pitched over a pit. It's better insulated, he said. And besides, it's like old times. He patted his left leg and said, I told you I stiffened up in the night. Well, that's not strictly true. It's shrapnel they didn't dig out. He boiled a kettle, and when he poured out a couple of mugs full of tea, we wandered back to the churchyard wall. There to your left, he said. See that slight subsidence? No? Never mind, take my word for it, there is one. Roughly it's nine by five, which is about right for a coffin, and part of it's under the wall. Proves that it's been rebuilt. The wall. Several times. He looked at me. Evidently, I wasn't getting the message. Look, he said, they weren't like us. Religion was magic. They believed all they were told. If Piers Hebron's folks couldn't wangle him into consecrated ground, the church or its yard, they'd plant him as near as they could. And they wouldn't have dropped him in a hole like a dead cat. He would rate a stone coffin which would have survived intact. He stroked his chin. Then he grinned. We're two of a kind, he said. Experts. Damned irritating. By this time the sun was well up and someone was crossing the meadow. Perhaps Keech to check progress. But it wasn't. Oh, Lord, it's the Colonel. Moon exclaimed, don't go, he'll only pursue you up your ladder. He was a tall, drooping man, carelessly dressed, disorganised, the sort of man you couldn't make any contact with. Perhaps his sister, the redoubtable Adela, had been his lifeline, and now he was adrift. Ah, he said. Hello. Yes. Making progress? Pushing ahead? Moon stood up. The colonel stirred around a bit and unknowingly prodded his ancestor's grave designate with his foot. Ah, he said. Very interesting. Like having new traps around. Makes a change. Well, must be getting along. This is Mr. Birkin, Colonel, Moon said. He's come to put us in the picture about what's above the Chancel Arch. The Colonel looked at my boots. Jolly interesting, he said. You can stay as long as you like, Birkin. Care to umpire for us on Saturdays? Mossop says he can't stand for too long at a time these days. Well, must be on my way. I'll tell Moss if you'll take over, very civil of you. He dawdled off. Then he turned. Found anything out of the ordinary, Moon? Artifacts? No gold bits and pieces, I suppose? Moon looked more mournful than ever, but acknowledged the reasonableness of the inquiry by uttering a strangled sound. Mustn't mind my asking. Just showing an interest. And he shambled off. That was a fairly typical beginning to most days. A mug of tea in Moon's dugout, usually not saying much, while he had a pipe. In those first days at Oxcoby, I was engrossed in my work. It was tremendously exciting. To begin with, I wasn't sure what I was uncovering. Medieval wall paintings keep to a well-thumbed catalogue. There is Christopher wading through fishes and mermaids with the Christ child on his shoulder. There are those boring female saints stoically enduring wheel, rack and sword slicing. These fitted conveniently along aisle walls or above the nave arcade. But the great spread of wall between chancel arch and roof timbers almost always got the big treatment, a judgment. Big casts need big stages. 
and the tall wall around the great arch could be arranged very appropriately with Christ in majesty at its apex, the falling curves nicely separating the smug souls of the righteous trooping off stage north to paradise from the damned dropping, normally head first, into the bonfire. So I began my labours by testing this likelihood, using a short ladder to reconnoitre the apex. And it was so. By the end of the second day, a very fine head was revealed. Yes, a very fine head indeed. Sharp beard, drooped moustache, heavy-lidded eyes outlined in black, a measure of my painter's calibre. This was no catalogue Christ, insufferably ethereal. This was a wintry hardliner. Justice. Yes, there would be justice, but not mercy. That was writ large on each feature, for when by the week's end I reached his raised right hand, it had not been made perfect. It still was pierced. This was the ox could be Christ, uncompromising, no more, threatening. This is my hand. This is what you did to me. And for this, many shall suffer the torment, for thus it was with me. Moon saw this at once. Hmm, he murmured. I wouldn't fancy being in the dock if he was the beak. And hair shall come with woundus red to damn the quick and the dead. But for me, the exciting thing was more than this. Here I was, face to face with a nameless painter reaching from the dark to show me what he could do, saying to me as clear as any words, if any part of me survives from time's corruption, let it be this, for this, was the sort of man I was. That was the second part of The Month in the Country by J.L. Carr. It was abridged by Elizabeth Bradbury, read by Samuel West, and produced by Tracy Neal. You can hear part three at the same time tomorrow night. Of an eight-part book at bedtime, A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr. Tom Birkin, a shell-shocked survivor of the Great War, is installed on his scaffolding and is busy uncovering and restoring a medieval wall painting in the church of Oxgaby, a north country village, at the bequest of the late Laura Hebron. He's met his employer, the rather hostile Reverend Keach, and the affable Charles Moon, who has come to the village through another condition of the Hebron will, that is, to find the grave of Miss Hebron's ancestor, Piers Hebron. Kathy Ellerbeck was the first native of Oxgoodby who came to see what I was up to in the church. She was the girl who had stared from the station master's house at my coat and me. She was 14 years old, in her last term at the village school, big for her age, blue-eyed and freckled. She flung open the door. Hello there, she called. Mr. Birkin, can I come up? I came to the platform's edge, looked down from the scaffolding and told her that I'd made a rule no one must come up while I was working. Except Mr. Moon. We had a reciprocal agreement. I could go down his hole and he could climb my ladder. Did she know Mr. Moon? And how did she know my name? Yes, she knew Mr. M, all right. Everybody in Ox could be knew him. And even though I hadn't had any letters yet, that's why everybody knew I was Mr. T. Birkin. Mr. Moon had spread it around. And what did the T stand for? You never mind what the T stands for, I said. Young girls call me Mr. I saw you get off the train, she said. My dad's Mr. Ellerbeck, the station master. Dad said, that's the chap from down south, the one who's going to do a cleaning job on that wall in the church. I'm Kathy Ellerbeck. How did your father recognise me, I asked. Mr. Mossop warned us you were coming. My dad said it was to look in and inquire how you were getting on. He said you were an opportunity that mightn't come again in a lifetime in a little spot like this. Watching an artist at work, I mean. I'm not an artist, I said. I'm a labourer who cleans up after artists. I'm here to uncover a wall painting. We have a picture painted on our chapel wall she said. Behind the pulpit, three big arum lilies. The man who put the transfer on came from York. Mam liked the one he had of roses, but in the end Mr. Douthwit and Dad decided that since it was to be in full view of the congregation, it had better be lilies. Why? I asked. Oh, I don't know, she exclaimed savagely and changed the conversation. About you being on your own up there, Dad said I could leave the gramophone under a seat and whenever I called I could play you some sacred songs and solos. Right. I said, it's about time I stopped talking and got on with some work. Play something. She wound up the spring and a fruity contralto began to rattle off. Angels ever bright and fair, take, oh, take me to your care. Ah, I shouted over my shoulder. Very suitable. I'm expecting to come across two or three angels up here any time now. After that, she used to come on most days, sometimes bringing her younger brother Edgar. From their accounts, 
and from judicious pumping, their mother worked out how it was with me and usually sent a bit of whatever was being manufactured in her kitchen. Rabbit pie, a couple of currant tea cakes, two or three curd tarts. Over the weeks, a splendid repertory of North Riding dishes. Encouraged by this bounty, I began to cherish the hope of lasting out until Christmas if the weather didn't turn cold or keech too hostile. It must have been nine or ten days before Mrs. Keech, the vicar's wife, visited. It was so hot the day she came that the grey cat let me approach almost to within touch before it slipped off Elijah Fletcher's box tomb into the rank grass. It was here, above Elijah, that normally I sat and ate at midday, looking across to Moon's camp, letting summer soak into me. I nudged back my bum and lay flat on the stone table, covered my eyes with a khaki handkerchief and dropped off into a deep sleep. When I awoke, she was leaning against the grey limestone wall looking towards me. She was wearing a dusky pink dress. Have you been here long? I asked. Maybe ten minutes? I'm not sure. She spoke shyly. A wide-brimmed straw hat cast a shadow over her face so that I couldn't tell how old she was. Then for a few moments she stood without speaking, her look wandering across the fabric of the church, then turning to follow the haphazard flight of a red admiral until it flattened against a headstone pinned to its lichen by the sun. I slipped down from the slab, but still leant against it, drowsy, only half awake. Are you comfortable in the bell loft? she asked. Is there anything that you need? Are you sleeping well? I could lend you a travelling rug. We don't use it at this time of year. My husband said you walked here. From the railway station, I mean. You can't have been able to carry much, so I'm supposing that you're sleeping on the floor. Perhaps you've guessed that I'm Mrs. Keach, the vicar's wife. Alice Keach. I told her that I had a sleeping bag, and there was my top coat if I needed it, and I was using a hassock for a pillow. The butterfly flew into the air once more. For a moment it seemed that it might settle on the rose in her hat, but it veered off and away into the meadow. The sound of bees foraging from flower to flower seemed to deepen the stillness. I'm afraid you must think us inhospitable, she said, all of us in our beds and you up there on the floorboards. I said that it suited me very well and that it's what I'd bargained for. At the end of each day I was so tired that it didn't need a feather bed to send me off to sleep. I saw Moon's head rising above the grass as he heaved himself into the sunshine and began an elaborate dance, waving his arms upwards and sideways. I'd seen him at it before. He hadn't found anything out of the ordinary. He was just working off cramp. All the same, I shall bring a rug, she said, and left the wall. She walked forward only a few paces, but near enough for me to see that she was much younger than Keach, no more than nineteen or twenty, and that she was very lovely. I'd seen enough paintings to know beauty when I saw it, and in this out-of-the-way place, here it was before me. And when will there be something for us to see? she asked. I told her that it would be like a jigsaw, a face, a hand, a shoe, and then, imperceptibly, it would come together. But you don't need to be told what might have disappeared in five hundred years, I said. I can't believe someone else hasn't had a go at uncovering the painting before me and that I'll find patches of bare plaster. Oh, she said, but isn't that the exciting part of it? Not knowing what's round the corner. Then she turned away towards the gate, and I turned too and went back onto my platform. And I wondered about Keach and his wife, and how the oddest people meet and then live together year after year, look at each other across hundreds of meals, watch each other dress and undress, whisper in the darkness, cry aloud in the marvellous agony of sexual release. You had the lovely Alice to see you, Moon said when we met that evening. I saw her in the churchyard. Didn't you find her a bit of a stunner? I did, I said. Quite extraordinary, in fact. Fancy that gem of purest grey serene hidden away in Oxcudby's unfathomable caves, and Keach catching her. From the moment he got her to sign on the sanctified line, other men could go as far as that line and no further. It's a devil. Perhaps he's all she wants, I said. Rubbish, Moon explained. You've seen him. Worse, you've heard him. Well, perhaps he was right. Frankly, if Keach really was as awful as he seemed, living with him didn't bear thinking about it. Come on, Moon said. Let's go up to the shepherd and sink a jar to lost beauty. The work went on. 
My picture was so well preserved that I became more and more convinced that even before it was forty or fifty years old, it had been hidden beneath a lime wash. Why? The priest found fault with its iconography. The local magnates took umbrage at some fancied resemblance. Take your choice. And then, over the centuries, after each fifty years or so of taper, candle smoke, paraffin lamps, the painting had taken on another layer of cover-up. So once I got the hang of it, the job followed a steady pattern, cleaning down the years to the painting itself. Well, perhaps I'm making it sound too easy. It wasn't, but I got better at it as the days passed. Really, it boiled down to a game of patience. My first move had been to grid the likely area of colour into chalked square feet, and then to inch along, only straying from one square to the next to follow a hand or a face. It simply isn't possible to return a 500-year-old wall painting to its original state. At best, I aimed at approximation, uniformity, something that looked right. And so, day followed day out there on the scaffolding, shuffling sideways and backwards, on my knees, up on my haunches. Bringing back that long dead artist's apocalyptic picture into daylight obsessed me. It wasn't long before I'd made a foray up, down and across it and had a fair idea of the whole. It was a judgment. A great pyramid of folk, split by the chancel arch. The judge and his bailiff, below them three lords clad first in finery, then only in furnace glare. And finally the multitudes trooping right to paradise, or being tossed screaming over the left-hand fiery brim. Even when I wasn't on the job, I found myself dwelling on that immense spread of colour, particularly during those first two or three weeks when only moon interrupted me. But then, inevitably, as happens to most of us, first through Saturday umpiring, later Sunday chapel, I was drawn to the changing picture of Oxcoby itself. But oddly, what happened outside was like a dream. It was inside the still church before its reappearing picture that was real. I drifted across the rest, as I have said, like a dream, for a time. One day, Cathy Ellerbeck brought an invitation to lunch. Mam says she wants you to come and have your Sunday dinner, she yelled up the ladder. It's our turn for the preacher, and it's that Mr. Jagger from North Allerton, and he's a bit above our heads, but she says the two of you will get on like a house on fire. You can come with us to Sunday school after, with Edgar and me. I'm a bit old, surely, I called back. For Sunday school, I mean. You can give Mr. Douthwit a hand with the big lads. Mam says you're over much on your own and need to be got into company. Don't put that coat on unless it's raining. She was a very organising girl and had it all cut and dried, so on Sunday I made an unusual effort to look respectable so as not to let her down, turned up at the station master's house at the bidden hour, and almost immediately we sat down round the starched tablecloth. Mr. Ellerbeck then launched into a grace of impressive length, doubtless showing his paces to a fellow professional, Mr. Jagger. The Yorkshire puddings, thick ones in onion gravy, were set before us, and Mr. Ellerbeck signalled the start by tucking a very large starched napkin into his stiff collar, and I followed suit. It was an exceedingly hot day, and we all sweated freely. Conversation did not flow easily around the Ellerbeck table. The business to hand was the relishing of victuals, and its only accompaniment was some vigorous plate scraping by Edgar and an occasional half-suppressed belch. The prelude to the main, and as I discovered the final course, was a flashy virtuoso recital by Mr. E on his long knife and steel before carving a very fine joint of sirloin. Cocking an eye at me, he murmured modestly, My father was a butcher, Mr. Birkin. But Mr. Jagger, too, was no mean performer, quite able to keep pace with our advance across very large platefuls, whilst delivering a lecture on the excellence of the works of Mr. Thomas Hardy, most of whose moral tales he claimed to have perused several times. There was no need to do more than demonstrate wakefulness by an occasional nod, Eventually, he was deservedly imprisoned for the afternoon in the front room for a nap. I then went off dutifully to Sunday school, where, as I feared, its superintendent, Mr. Douthwaite, the village smith, hived off three big lads needing, as he said, particular attention. When he had gone to his own corner, and finding a study of St. Paul's letter to some near eastern city or other kindled no flame in the breast of my conscripts, I allowed one to teach me how to crimp wheat straw into buttonholes, whilst another, inquired earnestly into the exact nature of the perils he had been warned would beset him if ever he set foot in London. At the least, I kept them quiet. The blacksmith recruited me for the remaining Sundays of my sojourn. It was even hotter when we traipsed off down the road towards the railway station. Edgar picked some cornflowers for his mother. You're coming back for your tea, aren't you? 
Cathy said, looking at me as if I had given satisfaction. Ma'am said you could. That was the third part of A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr. It was abridged by Elizabeth Bradbury, read by Samuel West, and produced by Tracy Neal. You can hear the fourth part at the same Never. time. Now the fourth of an eight-part book at bedtime, A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr. Tom Birkin, who's in Oxgaby to restore a medieval wall painting, and Charles Moon, who's searching for a lost grave, have begun to build up a relationship over the hot summer weeks of 1920 as they begin to uncover the mysteries of the North Country village. Tom has by now met other inhabitants of the village, and they're proving to be crucial to his finding a contentment he never thought possible after the disorientation of the Great War. By the end of July, I knew I had a masterpiece on my hands a medieval wall painting to rival that of St. Albans. Up on the platform above the chancel arch, I'd sit cross-legged and think my way through the day's work before I began to uncover a face or hand. In my job, there can't be a second shot. I worked hard until six or seven in the evening, and by this time I'd got down to my last bob. Still, Keats showed no sign of forking out a first instalment on my wages. He was going to make me ask for it, and this irritated me. But when I walked up to the village grocers and found I hadn't a penny to buy a paper, there wasn't much left but to knuckle under. His vicarage turned out to be in a small wood. Of course, it hadn't been built in one. The saplings planted by some earlier incumbent had become immense soaring trees, and their undergrowth had blotted out any lawns or flower beds that may once have been there. Round a turn in the drive, I came across a hare. It gazed in amazement at me. A jay flew across. Why, the place was a latter-day Eden. The house was in a clearing. The once white bricks had taken on an unpleasing greenish tinge so that they had a damp look. The windows were mostly shuttered, and the building's severity was only ameliorated by a twin-pillared portico. Advancing on this, I found a miniature easel displaying a pallid print of mountains and a lake framed in red plush, the kind of fancy nonsense posed in fireless grates. As I knocked at the door and then dragged the bell, I considered the significance of this extraordinary decoration and found none. My several well-mannered tugs were unanswered, so quite annoyed I gave the thing a really savage drag. A good six inches of wire scraped from the hole and when released shot back like a catapult. Deep inside the house I heard a bell tinkling. For a moment I believed it was someone laughing at me. Then the white-painted door opened and Alice Keach looked out. Her eyes were larger and darker than I'd remembered them. When we had met in the churchyard, she had been cool, almost too self-contained. But here on home ground, she was overwrought. And before I had time to ask if I might see her husband, she had come out upon the portico and had launched into a rather wild account of what it was like living there, as though she mistook me for a diocesan investigator of clerical dwellings. It occurred to me that perhaps she was one of those shy people who, given notice, can put on a bold front, but caught off guard, go to pieces. It was astonishing. Here I was, almost a stranger, being told of a most alarming nightmare she'd been having, how trees had been closing in on her, dragging up their roots and actually advancing. And the air, too, had pressed in till she had felt the house had become a compression chamber. She infected me with this obsession. Yes. Yes, I told her, I knew exactly what she was talking about, because it was like that when a really big shell exploded. The air in a dugout is sucked out, then blown in. A quite stupefying sensation. I'm sure that she didn't hear me. Then she pulled herself together. I managed to say that I'd like to have a word with her husband, and we set off down a longish stone-flagged corridor, passing by several outsized doors. She opened one of these. The room had two large windows blinded by interior shutters and but for an unusually small fireplace was absolutely empty. As we passed along, she touched each door and murmured, This one too, just the same. Their living room was very long and lofty, with four immense uncurtained windows rising from the floorboards almost to the ceiling. The floor was bare, well, not quite bare. There were a few skimpy rugs leaping distance apart. Keach was sitting on a hard chair by a rickety music stand and evidently had been playing the fiddle, which now was lying on a small table. Oddly enough, he didn't seem at all put out by his wife's hysterical commentary on their domestic hardship. Instead, he listened carefully as though he too was hearing this for the first time. 
truthfully, I was fascinated. Because it had never occurred to me that too big a house might have the same appalling drawbacks as too small a one. And only the reflection that I'd no home at all, except the precarious tenancy of a church belfry, shielded me from black depression. Then, a most extraordinary thing happened. She stopped talking, and both stared in horror at something behind me. The hair rose on my neck, and I turned with utmost reluctance, really very afraid of what I might see. It was only a cat. But it was the largest cat, and certainly the fiercest looking animal that ever I saw in my life. It had a fluttering song thrush clamped in its bloody jaws, and glared through the window, malevolently eyeing each of us in turn. Then it slipped back amongst the rank grass and briars. I said I must go. Frankly, I was eager to get outside again. That house, they shouldn't have been made to live in it. And yet both seemed able to throw it off like a cloak. Alice Keach, inside, nervy, obsessive, outside, charming, well within herself. As for her husband, until we met again, I felt quite sorry for him. She walked out into the clearing with me and paused by a bush of roses rampaging onto the gravel. Sarah Van Fleet, she said. It was a pink rose, a single. It's an old variety. Mind, it has sharp thorns. And it keeps on blooming, you'll see. There'll be some right into autumn. She smiled. Even if you don't visit us again, you'll know. I usually wear one in my hat. Here, take one. Later in the day, when I had to turn down Moon's suggestion that we go up to the pub, I remembered why I visited the vicarage. But Mossop turned up next day with an envelope containing an instalment, a couple of crumpled notes and a receipt for me to sign. That rose, Sarah Van Fleet. I still have it, pressed in a book. Some day, after a sale, a stranger will find it there and wonder why. A couple of days after my visit to the Keeches, I was up on the platform as usual when Cathy Ellerbeck made her normal noisy entrance. Hello up there, Mr. Birkin, she called. I haven't come to bother you. Then she seated herself in a pew which caught the sunlight. Why aren't you at school, I said. And why didn't I hear the bell this morning? We've broken up for a month. Far too long, I said. But you can always help your mother. Mam says she doesn't see how you can make a living at your job. She says there can't be all that many pictures hidden on walls. Well, I don't make much of one. Well then, she said. Why don't you change your job and stay on at Oxford Bay? I asked her what I should live on. Did she think her dad would find me a job portering on his station? Well, no, she replied. A porter doesn't need as much education as you have. What then, I asked. You could work for the council like being a rent collector or a school teacher. You've been to a college. When I remarked that she seemed very eager for me to remain in Oxcombe, she explained that her parents had taken a liking to me, and also I'd be much missed by others of her acquaintance as I was quite well thought of for my reformative work at the Sunday school, as well as for my voice roaring away in the Ellerbeck pew at chapel. The Wesleyans gave a livelier performance than Keach ever put on. To begin with, there was a different preacher every time, clerks, shopkeepers, one even was a yeast salesman. But mostly they were farmers or their labourers, men who'd left school at 12 or 13. Their convictions were as firm as a bishop's, but employing the vernacular in common usage behind Kirkburn and Revo, they might have been preaching in a foreign language. But I had a standing invitation to have a bit of supper at the station house on a Sunday and felt duty bound to pay for my keep. I'll think about it, I said, but now I must see about earning the balance of my pay, which I confidently believe Mr. Keach will hand over any day now. And so it went on until, after a longer than usual silence, I looked down and she had gone. But she'd put the axe to the very roots of my self-esteem. Surely we shouldn't be required, even by worthy Ellerbex, to justify the ethics of our labours. Our jobs are our private fantasies, our disguises, the cloak we can creep inside to hide. And to be brought to book twice in one week is against natural justice. But I was. Alice Keach would discreetly leave the church door slightly ajar and then seat herself in the back pew and shelter behind her wide-brimmed straw hat, a rose tucked into its band. 
But for the occasional creak in the scaffold whenever I shuffled back a pace to see what I'd been doing, the building was so still that although I was a good thirty paces away and my back towards her, we talked casually as we might have talked in a parlour. Really, there was no need to look. From the way she put things, I could see her face. How did you come to take up this kind of occupation, Mr. Birkin? A mischievous twist to her lips, a mock innocent gaze. I mean, how did you discover that such a job existed? Was it in the family? If she could have seen Dad in his office at the scented soap factory, packing his Gladstone bag of samples. Well, yes, in a way I was, Mrs. Keach. We were in the cleaning business. I was working up the brothers from Luke 16, blissfully heedless of the judgment to come. The second magnate's cloak was a splendid garment, red outside and green lining, a very good red, resin-based. The best, in fact, no expense spared. You can't get away from it. If you want quality, you have to pay in one way or another. My wife, Vinnie, had quality, and I paid for it all right. Mr. Birkin, I can't see much from down here, Mr. Birkin. Please, what are you at now? I'm cleaning a gent's overcoat. Is it very soiled? Very. You can't beat tallow candles for laying down a nice grease base for other muck to stew in. You modern women don't know you're born. The thing that keeps you from screaming... Well, that's extreme. Let's say it helps if you can guess how things once were. What I'm really getting at is that it's not all that easy to find your way back to the Middle Ages. They weren't us in fancy dress, mouths full of these and thous, quoths, prithies and zooms. They had no more than a few entertaining distractions to take their minds off death and birth, sleep and work, and their prayers to the Almighty Father and his stricken son when things got too awful. So in my job, it helps if you can smell candles, guttering in draughts, petitioning release for souls in purgatory. Then you put that extra bit into the job. You go at it with emotions as well as diluted hydrochloric. Mr. Birkin. Mr. Birkin, is it an oil painting or a watercolour or what is it, for goodness sake? It's all sorts of things, Mrs. Keach. Item one sack of verdigris, item red ochre, three pounds a penny, three pecks of wheat flour. I suppose you could lump it all as tempera. You're making fun of me. I'm not entirely stupid, you know. An aunt gave me a paint box for my birthday. I recall it had a marvellous slab of purple. And then that spurt of laughter like a bell. I'm not making fun of you, Mrs. Keach. Ask Mr. Douthwaite at the smithy. He'll understand having to make do. Flatten this, splay that, till it's something not listed in the ironmonger's catalogue. My departed colleague's lad, at tenpence a week, would do his best with a slab of flat marble and scrape his knuckles grinding Spanish white, Baghdad indigo, Cornish malachite. And he would need a tin bowl to break eggs. No bigger than a wood pigeon's, I'm told. Naturally, he'd suck the yolk before staring in colour onto the white. And my departed friend would yell down, Hey, you, idle jack, some more green. Which green? The cloak lining green, fathead, the malachite, and look sharp. We have to be off to Beverly first thing Tuesday, and God knows what the roads will be like in these Holderness swamps. Poor boy. Lucky boy. He might have been soaking out on the plough strips. Anyway, you of all people shouldn't spare him a haperth of sympathy. He used your husband's altar slab to do his grinding on. Good gracious. How can you possibly know what the poor fellow did? Found a tinge of red in an undercut of one of the consecration crosses. That was how we talked. And after a longer silence than usual, I would know she had gone. That was the fourth part of A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr. It was abridged by Elizabeth Bradbury, read by Samuel West, and produced by Tracy Neal. And you can hear the fifth part at the same time tomorrow night.